Today's program is being recorded. Any views expressed in this webinar are for general educational purposes only and do not represent any official views or positions of the sponsoring or presenters organizations. We are looking forward to your questions at the end of the program. Submit them anytime during the talk when you have a comment or question. Please use the Q&A box. Greetings and welcome to, to today's educational program. Webinar number one in the series, Applying MSA for Attributes, How to Know Pass Fail Measures for Reliable by Sandy Fuscher and Doug Wood. This is your moderator, Shobha Mittal from ASQ Quality Management Division. Today we have the distinct pleasure of hearing from Sandy Fuscher and Doug Wood. Please join me in welcoming her. Mr. Wood has worked over 40 years in the areas of cost of quality, office waste, root cause analysis, performance measurement. He has helped others with various ASQ certifications in quality auditing, management, and engineering. He has also taught auditing, lean, Six Sigma, cost of quality, statistics, and failure modes and effects analysis. He has four ASQ certifications, CQE, CQA, SSBB, and CMQOE. He has published the Certified Manager of Quality Organizational Excellence Handbook 5th Edition by ASQ Quality Press, which is also co-edited by Sandy, the Executive Guide to Understanding and Implementing Quality Cost Program, Reduce Operating Expense and Increase Revenue by ASQ Quality Press, Principles of Quality Cost, Financial Measures for Strategic Implementation of Quality Management, 4th Edition by ASQ Quality Press. His firm, DC Wood Consulting LLC has worked with clients in manufacturing, healthcare, and transactional businesses. The company's website is www.dcwoodconsulting.com. And so, without further ado, it is my utmost pleasure to introduce Sandy and Doug to you all. Doug, the floor is all yours. Okay. Thank you, Shoba. Um, so, uh, we're, we're going to do this talk in two parts here. Uh, I'm going to start. And then Sandy's going to finish the, uh, the example at the end of the end of the course here. Um, but Sandy and I work together to put this material together. Uh, we want to remind everybody that this is uh, it's presentation number one in our in our series on uh, the the these are key topics around the certified quality process analyst. Um, it, it that is a certification ASQ has that is not well known, but we wanted to kind of highlight key aspects of it here in this series. Uh, the series will run from now into next year, so hopefully you'll be able to you know brush up on these process analyst pieces here. Uh, so uh, we're looking at applying MSA for attributes now. MSA measurement systems analysis. Uh, it encompasses both uh, gauge r and r and attribute agreement analysis. But attribute agreement analysis is for pass-fail measures. So, Sandy, next slide. Okay. We want to make sure that everybody here understands the, the importance of attribute measurement systems analysis. Okay. Uh, we're bringing this to you because we want to make sure that you, you grasp you know what what this is good at all right we want to see how if you've got visual inspection you want to make sure that your visual inspectors are conforming to the known requirements but you also want them to be consistent with each other and with themselves over time so we're going to learn how uh, various requirements might be or uh, sufficient or not sufficient for quality professionals next slide sandy So measurement systems analysis comes in 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 these two flavors. Okay, um, it it's uh, it looks at gauge R and R and attribute agreement analysis. Now gauge repeatability and reproducibility is a core concept in many industries that use devices to measure variable metrics. Now this presentation is going to focus on the other one, attribute agreement analysis. Okay, uh, because that lets you see how much of the variation in your 
in your visual inspection comes from the process of measurement and how much of the variation comes from the thing you want to know, the actual variation of the item or part. I bet you didn't know that you could do this. Uh, next slide. So, again, either one of these two has three parts, whether, you know, at gauge R and R or attribute agreement analysis. Okay. There's, you know, three parts. Two of them are bad and one is good. If the repeatability is too poor, as in a large number, and or the reproducibility is too poor, as in a large number, relative to the part-to-part -part variability, you cannot trust your measures. The measure will vary widely, and these process of measures will hide the actual part-to-part -part variation. Obviously, this impedes good control. Next slide. So here are some core questions to ask about your measurement processes. Now, you may not actually have answers to all of these, okay? But in asking these questions, you will gain better depth of knowledge of your metrics and your processes. Is the measurement system capturing the correct data? Does the data reflect what is happening? Can we detect process changes when they occur? What are the sources of measurement error? Is the measurement system itself stable over time? And is the measurement system capable of generating the data that's needed for making decisions? Okay, because that's the whole point of measuring is to make decisions. Next slide. So the steps to use are these. Doing the steps in this order will set you on the right path. First, identify and define what the quality characteristics are. Secondly, you want to define the sampling method, the size, and the procedure. Okay, we're all pretty familiar with that technique. Third, we want to develop standard data collection procedures. Where does the data go? How is it written down? Then you need to step four, train the assessors. Uh, again, we know that inspectors need to be trained. Number five, then you do this measurement analysis once you've done all four of those initial steps. Number six, collect the data and look at how the system's performing. And number seven, yeah, improve the system. Cycle back and fix it again. I bet you you can see plan, do, check, act in this, can't you? Next slide. So this is where you begin to grasp the context of our data collection as the basis for a solid measure. Make sure your records are complete. Check for missing values. Create a time series plot, some sort of diagram. Look at the data, plot the data, and see if something does not fit. Review the subsets. Do similar processes give similar results? If not, then there's something out of whack. Also, you want to make sure your data types are consistent, okay? Uh, text entry, numeric entry. If you're working with spreadsheets, you know that it's possible to get text where you want numbers and numbers where you want text. Next slide. Now you kind of do a gut check. How well do you think this is going to measure, predict what you want to evaluate? Would different people looking at the same data come to the same conclusions? What are the possible issues in the scope of what we're measuring? And again, this is not a statistical approach, but this helps to avoid some of the assumptions you make when you're setting up an, ins an inspection process. Next slide. So now you move into the agreement analysis itself, okay? Planning, set up, choose the people, choose the parts, make sure you choose the environment. Train the assessors, and yes, randomize. Rand randomizing is, is important. You do not want 
all the same parts to go through the same order multiple times for the inspectors. And you don't want each the inspectors to see them all in the same order. Randomizing provides your overall study with robustness. Next slide. So you want to have a minimum of two, but maybe three or more appraisers, but you're going to need an expert. Now, sometimes having a team of experts, okay, grade good or bad, according to their expertise, provides you with a standard call. In other words, the parts are predetermined to be good and bad by experts. You want 20 items, more is better, at least 20, uh, and you want to represent different types of failures, and you necessarily want to look at the gray areas, okay? You, you want to make sure that it's not just all extra good or extra bad. The gray area is where you're going to see differences. We recommend a mix of 50-50 good to bad is recommended with some in the gray area. So an expert then looks at these and develops the known standard information, one expert or several experts, okay? Then each, one, each item is measured at least two non-consecutive times by each appraiser during the test. So the appraiser comes in and looks at all of these 20 or more items and decides whether it's good or bad. Uh, then they, they do it again. But they don't do them consecutively. They, they, there's a break, and then they come back and do it again so that they reset their brain. These items should be numbered and randomized for each appraiser under each trial. That can be a little tricky because you don't want the number to tell the appraiser that they previously identified, like, say, number two as good or bad. So one approach is each time you go through a, a, a trial, Keep track of which part is actually which, but then scramble the numbers on it, okay, so that the appraiser is not seeing the same item again with the same number on it, okay? See, what, that's what we mean by randomizing. Uh, an acceptable accuracy score is, you know, 80% or better, okay? That's a rule of thumb. So... This would measure how well the appraisers are measuring against the known standard. Next slide. So these are the five results from the analysis. The percent by appraiser. Now, this, this shows individual self-consistency, okay? Is the appraiser doing the same thing each time they see the part? You see why we, we put them in random order then? We don't want them to see them all in the same order. The percent by standard. Are they finding the good things and are they finding the bad things? <laughs> okay. Uh, obviously, that's the whole point of this is to separate good from bad. But this tells you whether your overall process is working. Percent by trial. Now, this can show you if this analysis itself is breaking down. Uh, if, if on the same trial, appraisers are getting precisely the same answer, then it's not random enough. On the other hand, if the percentage by trial gets worse and worse, maybe the appraisers are becoming tired so there's a couple of ways that that helps you validate the overall procedure. Percent of pass items. Okay. So these just this says are all the good items being found? Okay. And percent for bad items. Are all the bad ones being found? So you can see how useful that might be. Are, are these various inspectors being too picky or too lenient, all right, in, in whether they pass or fail things? So you can learn all of these things from an AAA study. How can you use this? Next slide.
So if you have visual inspection and you want to make it better, th things are not hopeless. You can improve. There's a lot of different aspects you can do, and, and I'm going to encourage you to uh, look at our references at the end. We recommend a book called Improving the Effectiveness of Visual Inspection by Ted Shorn, S-C-O-R-N, under our references at the end. These are just some of the things you can do. Um, you know, fatigue, environment distractions, we all know those. But what about training the inspector's eye movement to make sure that all the inspectors follow the same pattern of visual inspection? Next slide. Okay, so this, this is where Sandy's gonna take over. Okay, I'm gonna introduce Sandy here. Dr. Sandy Furter is a professor of practice at Ohio State University in the Department of Integrated Systems Engineering. She's applied Lean Six Sigma systems engineering and engineering management tools in healthcare, banking, retail, higher education, and other service industries. And she's achieved the level of vice president in several banking institutions. She previously managed the Enterprise Performance Excellence Center in a healthcare system. Dr. Furter received her PhD in industrial engineering with a specialization in quality engineering from the University of Central Florida in 2004. She received an MBA from Xavier University and a bachelor and master of science in industrial and systems engineering from the Ohio State University. So Dr. Furter has over 25 years experience in business process and quality improvements. She's an ASQ certified manager of quality organizational excellence. She's a certified Six Sigma black belt. She's a certified quality engineer, certified manager quality OE. She's an ASQ fellow, and she's a certified Six Sigma black, master black belt. Dr. Furter is an author, co-author on several academic journal articles, conference proceedings, and nine reference textbooks on Lean Six Sigma, designed for Six Sigma, Lean Systems, and Systems Engineering, including being the co-editor for the ASQ CQIA handbook and the ASQ CMQOE handbook. And she's the editor of the ASQ CQPA handbook which is what the series is focusing on. She also published a textbook on systems engineering, holistic life cycle architecture, modeling and design with real world applications from CFC Press. So Sandy, you're up. Thank you, Doug. Well, um, I'm so glad to see so many people out there um, that are interested in this topic. This is a pretty cool topic. And, and like Doug talked about, it is um, something that a lot of people haven't gotten much exposure to. I'm going to take you through an example related to healthcare, but I've got other examples. Um, I'll kind of talk a little bit to the one that I teach in my class. Um, and, and that's a pretty simple one, but it's really powerful to teach this. Um, and then I can even touch on one that we did in banking. So the, this one is assessing pressure ulcers. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, what a pressure ulcer is because before I got into healthcare, I I did not know. Um, so I had a quality background, industrial engineering background, but did not know the medical side. Um, however, once I got into this study, um, I re remembered back to when I was little and my my um, grandma uh, was in a wheelchair, so she had limited mobility. And so she'd have these kind of bruises on her skin and I'd be like, oh, you know, but I didn't know what they were. And I'm pretty sure they were probably um, some pressure ulcers. So I did not put pictures in here because it is close to dinner time. And um, if anybody has seen a pressure ulcer, they can go from looking like kind of bruises to um, some pretty gross um, looking and very dangerous um, um, uh, sores on the skin. Um, so this was a really important study from the perspective of getting this right. So we know that there are a lot of um, potential issues or vari variability in human diagnosis. And of course, um, the complexity of our system, of our body, uh, makes it even more difficult because everybody has variability. And so variation, there can be a lot of variation introduced. The attribute agreement analysis really can help us to focus on, let's make sure that what we're measuring is consistent so that we don't have to worry about the measurement system and we can really focus on getting that patient to be uh, uh, feeling better or to be um, going through the experience in a better way. So this study uh, was done by um, an, an analyst um, 
really led by an analyst, um, Ethling Hernandez. And she's just a really brilliant woman. And she's now a vice president for a health system, which is really cool. And she, I was so honored because she was um, one of my master's students when I was at the University of Central Florida. This study actually is published if you want to make a little note, or I can um, send a link to it um, in the International Journal of Statistics and Probability. So if you really um, want to geek out on the details of this, um, you can you can see that. So we actually studied this with nurses in the hospital and what what um, was found and um, it, for any of those in healthcare. Uh, nurses will almost always uh, come up with the best ideas for for um, improving things in healthcare because they know the processes, they care about and care for the patients, and so they they um, identify this this uh, area for a need for improvement. And so what they were finding was for um, in in hospitals. When a patient comes into the hospital and they're going to get admitted either through the emergency department or through the um, inpatient floor or through surgical or wherever they get um, uh, admitted to, the nurses um, within the first 24 hours need to do an assessment or even sooner in the emergency department will need to do an assessment of the patient's skin because they have to make sure that the patient isn't coming in with any issues, especially pressure ulcers. This is something that's measured by Medicare and Medicaid, and uh, Medicare and Medicaid will not pay for the care of, of uh, patients in a hospital if those pressure ulcers um, occurred because of the care or lack of care in the hospital. So you have to do a, an assessment one, because if they have it, they need to get treated um, pretty quickly because these can go from bad to worse pretty quickly. And then the other element is that um, we, we just need to make sure that, um, that, that they didn't have one when coming in. So there were two phases of this study, and one was looking at um, is this, this, this condition on the skin a pressure ulcer or not, because of course um, treatment could vary depending upon what it is, the, the diagnosis. And then if it is, how severe is it? What is the severity? And there are specific severity levels that are defined um, by, by the medical community. And so they, we worked with the assessors who were specially trained, the nurses who were specially trained to understand these challenges. And then we also were able to train and improve the measurement system based on the study. So that was really critical and very important. So again, the pressure ulcer, it's a localized injury to the skin and our underlying tissue. And this was the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid is the definition um, who, who provided the de definition. And it's as a result of pressure. So a lot of patients are immobile. I mean, we saw a lot of this through COVID where if people were on respirators, it would be difficult to move them. And so, and others are, are, are just um, uh, too frail or can't, don't have the mobility to move. So the nurses need to uh, move the patients um, every so often. In the hospital that I worked, at, uh, worked in, they would have, a song come on the the uh, the uh, PA the the announcement system every hour on the hour to remind the nurses to turn the patients. Um, this is was really important, and the song happened to be um, the turn 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 song by the I think it was the the birds um, for you know. So that um, would remind the nurses to do that. So really important from that perspective. So the CMS, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid, and why this is important is that the industry typically follows what, what CMS ends up doing. Well, they switch to what they call this value-based purchasing where they would not pay the providers if they were responsible for uh, lack of care uh, and, get, and the patient getting a pressure ulcer while they were in the hospital under their care. So it was a very important to assess this. Here are the stages. Um, you can see that it, it kind of goes from um, the skin still in, intact and the level stage one 
to uh, a, a, a stage four and then also to a deep tissue pressure injury. So these are the different stages. Now, as you can imagine, um, you can't just go into a hospital and kind of do a design new experiment where you've got a factorial and you can easily see all the conditions and all the stage, the different types of pressure ulcers and stages. So one limitation of the study uh, was that we had to look at pictures of pressure ulcers. So if if there are any um, healthcare providers out there, you're going to say, well, wait a minute, that might not mimic the real world very well. Um, it actually, it, it does leave out the ability to actually see and, and, and touch and smell uh, the, the area in the patient, but um, this was still an adequate study to be able to assess whether people were looking at these pictures of pressure ulcers and assessing them appropriately. So, you know, there's always limitations to any study. Okay, so the first phase uh, was we the typically it was to mimic assessing the patients when they arrived in the emergency department or were admitted to inpatient floors. They and then the normal process they had two phases and they would look at the pressure ulcer uh, and they would say is this a pressure ulcer or not because it could be other conditions and then if it was if they determined it was what severity or stage would they place it at. So they would train these, these specially trained nurses, and they would also have experts that would be training them. So we use those experts to assess this, to define the standard. So what we did, we had 21 specially trained nurses that would look at 25 pictures of skin injuries, and they would assess for each of the 25 photos, whether it's a pressure ulcer or not, if it was, what was the staging. The photos, Doug talked about this and the importance of it, were presented in random order so that people didn't remember, oh, that first one I really thought was a pressure ulcer and I thought it was stage four. Um, and so it was the random order. The other thing that we did after the study, which made it really effective, is everyone got together in a big conference room and then we looked at each of the pictures and had a conversation of why did you think this was a pressure ulcer? Why did you think it wasn't? Why did you think it was this stage or that stage? And so we really, the, the specially trained nurses learned from each other and also from the experts because the experts were the ones that defined whether these were explicitly, whether they were uh, pressure ulcers or not and which stage they were. So if um, you love Minitab or any statistical package like me, uh, this was all run in Minitab. And Minitab's nice because it has um, very easy menus to be able to go through this. Um, and so you can set up your study in Minitab and then you can, um, you, you can run the results as well. So this is one of the graphics that comes out of Minitab. And it's really cool because we have these, these um, 21 assessors looking at the 25 pictures. And they, you can see there's a little bit of variability in um, their agreement within themselves. There are some that the lines are very short, really shows um, that they, they were really um, very good at, at uh, assessing uh, each photo twice um, pretty accurately. And so we created confidence intervals around these. And what we, the kind of the bottom line was by using these confidence intervals, we could see that 95%, we are 95% confident that a certain specially trained nurse, say A, will agree with him or herself on whether it's a pressure ulcer or not anywhere between 54 and 90% of the time. So that was pressure, that was this first um, A was between 54 and 90%. There were some that were smaller uh, variability. So the average um, phase one, or sorry, the assessor agreement, so this is that uh, repeatability, the uh, self-consistency was 94% across all the assessors. Then the accuracy of the assessors versus the standard was 92%. So not quite as good, but still pretty high. Um, but you could see there were some um, STNs that were um, have had more variability, which you know you're gonna 
you're, that's going to be, you're going to see that. So the average agreement um, across the pictures was only 40% between the assessor's assessment to the standard. So that was pretty low. So just out of the 25 pressure officers, 10 of them were agreed on by all the STNs. So you can see that that leaves a lot uh, to be desired, a lot of variability. And so uh, the, the point of the assessment is not to ding people, it's to help them. Um, one, what I find is um, to help them better understand the operational definition. What is a pressure ulcer? What, is a what are the different severity levels? Uh, in my class, I, I said that I teach this in my class. I use a very simple example of the, the uh, students assessing the logo on an M&M. &M. So uh, they, they don't actually eat the ones that they all touch and try to assess, but I give them um, extra little packets of fun size M&Ms so they can have those. So, so that, there's always that incentive too. Um, but they have to assess the M&M logo of whether it's a pass or fail. And it never fails. There's usually about one team of students after we've already gone through the measure phase in the Six Sigma class talking about um, operational definitions and data collection and all that. And they still don't stop. You saw that that step in what Dunn covered was defining the operational definition. What is a good logo? What is a bad logo? So a, um, after the study, we did that with the assessors. We said, you know, what is a pressure ulcer? What is not a, a pressure ulcer? What are the different severities? So that's really super critical to understand what you're measuring. Um, and then to help those people, some of those, let me go back to this, some of those appraisers who have the longer line, the more variability, help them to get to the ones that are, to the small lines uh, for the ones that are better. So again, not to be punitive, but to help and improve the measurement system. And remember, of course, a person is only one per, one part of the measurement system. There's a lot of other things. We were, um, Doug and I were joking about scales before we everybody got on. Um, as far as uh, you know, that sometimes they're not too precise. Um, and then the um, the confidence interval for this uh, between assessor assessment to the standard was 21 to 61 percent. So. Um, whether all appraisers uh, assessments agreed. So this was the accuracy for within assessor agreement within themselves at 82% for phase two. So it was worse. So we saw it at 94%. So when they had to then try to put it into the four stages, it was much more difficult. And we see that. So you really think about, okay, what am I measuring? And is this important? Um, and, and certainly it is important to them. Um, so how can we get better at it? And then this shows the agreement of each STN. So the longer the line or the box, the, um, you know, the more variability each assessor has. This, what this graphic, um, shows nicely. If there are any of the photos that everybody agreed upon. And L and R, uh, something about those photos uh, that everyone was able to say, yep, it's it's a pressure ulcer, and this is the stage that it's at. Um, so you can see that there's just a dot and no variability shown in the box plot or the box. Um, and then out of the 25 pressure ulcers, only two of them, those that L and R were agreed to by everybody, and the confidence interval was 1 to 26% on that one. And then the, another thing that you look at when you're uh, analyzing the results is the contribution of the variation. And this nice graph from Minitab shows that you want most of the variation to be in the part to part, meaning you're gonna get different types of pressure ulcers. You're gonna get stages all from one to four um, you're going to get some of those that you really can't even put into stages and some that are that deep tissue type of stage. So you want to see the variation in the part to part. You don't want it to be in your measurement system in the repeatability and rep rep reproducibility um, portions. And this helps you to see that. 
And then here are some typical standards um, that that um, that we see in the literature for how do we know whether our um, accuracy is good enough to accept. Um, we can look at the contribution, which was related to those slides previously. We can also look at the um, percent study of, of the variation. And if it's less than 10%, that's good. And if the number of categories that you can discern are greater than 10, that's great. Um, the criticality, you, you want to look at um, how critical the, the application is. And for the percent study, if it's between 10 and 30, you may be able to accept that. The categories between 4 and 10. For, uh, for, for rejecting it, if the con percent contribution is greater than 9% or the percent study is greater than 30, or you can d distinguish them less than four categories, then you should reject it. Um, so it helps you to assess whether you have to kind of go back to the drawing board and put in a much better measurement system or just improve a little bit. So um, the uh, initial gauge in our gauge R in our study um, was we concluded that the measurement system was not accurate or not as good as we wanted it to be. We retrained the specially trained nurses and then repeated the study later on down the road. I don't have those results in here. The um, uh, but but it really helped people to understand the importance of measurement of defining your your attributes that your characteristics that you're measuring and how how you can improve um, and and work together to improve that. Um, some of the future research or future studies was um, to be able to look at this and. In the paper, I had some examples of, of some other studies that have been done in healthcare, and um, the, and there's they're mostly around equipment, but you can do a lot more with uh, human diagnosis in healthcare. And I also just very quickly, I know we're coming to where we want to answer some questions if you have them, um, but a study I did do in um, in financial services was in a bank. Where we we had um, the more the, it was a mortgage department and it was those folks who um, worked with outside vendors who appraised houses. And if you've ever gotten appraisal from a house, they're probably about 50 pages with all the pictures of comparable uh, houses that are in and around your neighborhood. And so how good is each appraisal, how, how, how um, accurate are the, um, the different elements of the appraisals? And so that was fairly complex. The, the thing about these attribute agreement analysis is they're not usually as easy as discerning whether the logo on an M&M is uh, good or bad. And sometimes we don't care because we're going to eat that blue M&M anyway. But you know, these, these can be very complex measurement systems, um, and that's why it's really important, and it really helps us to understand how good our measurement system is by doing these studies. Um, there's our references, and um, we, we will send anyone that wants it the PDF of this, of this um, uh, presentation, and there's that paper that I have, and um, the uh, other reference is the book that uh, Doug uh, talked about earlier that is a great application and explanation of visual inspection. And there's our contact information, and uh, I think we're here ready for questions. And I'm going to stop sharing. Thank you, Doug and uh, Sandy. Um, sure. Let's start with some questions and answers that we have. So, the first question I have is, how much training does an appraiser need? Hmm. I'm sorry, what was the question again? How much training does an appraiser need? Um, that's a great question, and, and Doug um, certainly can jump in as well. So, so, from our healthcare system, these these um, specially trained nurses that assessed pressure ulcers were uh, more um, seasoned nurses that had had been there a while, and then they were trained um, 
I, I'm not sure exactly how long they were trained initially, um, but then they had additional training after we had done the measurement system analysis. So it's going to vary upon the application mm -hmm. and, um, and and also some of the um, desire. I think these these um, nurses self-selected to be involved in this type of of, uh, of assessment. So um, I don't have exact numbers, but on, on those, but I think it's really going to vary by application. I might add, to Sandy, that uh, uh, in in what I've seen with visual inspection, uh, oftentimes you'll have you know experienced uh, inspectors, and you'll bring them through a study first, and that enables you to say, well, how good does it get, right? Uh, and you might improve them a little bit, but this technique can be used also for inexperienced inspectors. You know, once you've done it once with experienced inspectors. Then you bring in the newbies and you put them through this. And now you can tell which of the newbies need how much help. <laughs> okay. So this can be used as an assessment of is the training good enough? All right. So let's move on to the next question we have. All of the metrology I work with is completed automated, completely automated. Apologies. The appraiser places the lot on the tool and walks away. Does gauge R and R become gauge R? Since we have done the evaluation on different days and substituted day for appraiser. Hmm. Well, that's not exactly the point of our talk. That's that sounds like uh, you know the the gauge R and R the the measurement systems analysis of a variable measurement um, and we've been talking about attribute measurement um, but what i think is happening there is you're, you're completely automating it so therefore there is no uh, operator shift right you're not changing operators however you might have different equipment setups it might not be a single a single inspection station so then you might have the cause you might have some drifting as the equipment wears for multiple inspection stations. So that that's that's another consideration to think about if it's fully automated. Um, th did that answer your question? Was that was that uh, satisfactory? So Doug, I don't think they can answer you because they're no. muted. Yeah. Um, so. Okay. Uh, uh, you know, I think, you know, I'm going to move on to the next question. If this uh, person attending has more questions, they can definitely reach you out. I'm reading a yeah. comment there that they wanted to see the, your email addresses uh, slide one more time. But I think that when they get the email from us, that will have that contact information on it. Uh, moving on to the questions then. Uh, did you perform your ulcer study one time or do you continue to repeat it? Keep up with attrition, skill, experience, drift, etc. If you repeat it at what frequency? Yes, yeah, so I'll jump in first. Um, for this type of study, this was repeated twice during the time frame that um, I was uh, at, at the organization. Um, it's really um, how how often and how good the measurement system gets. So once you get to a pretty decent measurement system, um, you can you can reassess every so often. So it depends upon criticality as well. So I would probably say do this uh, reassessment once a year associated with the training, possibly of new um, specially trained nurses. Um, it depends how critical uh, the the quality characteristic is that you're measuring, and obviously pressure also was very critical. That's why we started on this, and then um, and then also kind of like control charts. You know, when I first uh, took and this is where I got interested in quality was my first statistical process control um, class in in college, and I just thought it was so cool. And I thought, wow, you know, you put control charts out there and you keep them out there forever. Well, you don't. You know, if if you if that characteristic is under control and you and things don't change, you don't you take that away. You might go back in. You know, if you're starting to have, or if 
um, you have some indication that it's important to go back in or maybe on a annual or, or every so often basis. So Doug, you might have some additional input to that. <clears throat> well, everybody's facing high staff turnover right now. Uh, and because this is a, uh, it, it's a, it's an individual skill set that you're looking at of the inspectors or the assessors. Uh, as as you gain, as you bring new assessors in, redoing it is is a uh, is a good thing to make sure that they're all still calibrated. They're mentally calibrated the same. The other thing has to do with the just something about the difficulty of doing the visual inspection. There are some visual inspections which are you know, you, you get your, basically you're locked in, you see something and you say, okay, that's good or bad. I can, I can tell that there's a clear indicator of something being good or bad. There's other inspections where it's a little gray and uh, operators can drift a little bit. So uh, doing this more often, if there's more drift in people's uh, visual assessment, and, and again, it, it's really hard to say in any given case how much drift is going on with inspectors, but it, it's, it's the drift you're trying to stop. You're trying to capture, we're drifting off the mark um, and we need to stop that to be consistent. Yeah, I think the next this question. One, oh, I was just going to say, go ahead. One of go ahead. Yeah, one of those times that it, the answer, it depends, <laughs> depends mm -hmm. upon the application, depends upon the factors, depends upon the people and all of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, 1 of the question is, where can I find additional resources on metrics and attributes? On, on metrics. Okay. Well, it just so happens that ASQ has a class on measuring process and organizational performance. <laughs> uh, there's there's a book in Quality Press called called that measuring process organizational performance uh, by by Duke Oaks O K E S, uh, and that helps you understand in general about metrics. When when you're talking about you know visual judgments, I can't, I cannot give a higher recommendation than the book by Ted Shorn, uh, the improvement of visual inspection, 200 pages. Now it's not a cheap book, but uh, it, it is not published by ASQ either. It's published by the American Foundry Society, but everybody has visual inspection. You, you don't, the, the cameras aren't good enough yet to do all of that. And even if they were, you'd have to recalibrate the camera every time you change your process and, and people are more flexible than that. So uh, I, I think perhaps those two books might be good references. Sandy, you got anything? No, I think that's great. I'm going to take two more questions in the interest of time because I also have to review the ending slides. So the first question uh, is, is the analysis impacted by the level of precision of the attributes? That is a score of 1 to 4 versus 1 to 10. Did you find you had to collapse the scoring if you too find like 1 to 10? Hmm. So this kind of reminds me of um, when you have a survey and you might have um, an attribute or a Likert scale that you've got for of uh, five points of, of of strongly agree all the way to strongly disagree, and where if you don't get enough um, responses, then you'll kind of collapse the fours and the fives with the ones two and and the ones two and three or something like that. I, I don't know that that really is the same. You know, kind of transfers over to this. Because the, like, for our categories for the stages, they were really important to define those from a diagnosis and a health and a, and a figuring out how to help the patient and the, you know, really the severity of how bad is it and, and how quickly do we, you know, need to attend to this and, and what kind of, of medications and treatment and everything would be done. So it's really, again, it's, it's, it's part of the uh, measurement system and the factors that are involved in that. So it's really going to depend upon what's needed. 
Now, you know, my first thought is um, for this act, for the pressure ulcers, it's most important to first do the first phase where it's, is it a pressure ulcer or not? Because then you go down different uh, pathways uh, from a, from a treatment perspective. And then once that happens, maybe you can engage more people in the staging. So you get perhaps get more experts um, involved than in the diagnosis of the severity, which is probably probably happened anyway. So, Doug, did you want to jump in on that too? Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I think that there's less of a danger of uh, this level of precision than there is if you're got if you're saying it's good or bad and it's bad how many ways. If um, if you have four or five different bad characteristics, uh, that's going to muddy your result more than uh, just uh, one to four, one to ten. So you need to absolutely define what is bad. Are there several types of bad? Um, otherwise, uh, that that you you can muddy your score because some people think bad version A is much worse than bad version B. Maybe that answers the question. Okay, the final question is then, how often should the operator be calibrated? As often as they need to be. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, <clears throat> I, I think if there's indication that the measurement is no longer appropriate. Uh, you need to get in and, and recalibrate it. Okay, recalibrate their brain. Um, obviously, if you get turnover, new people, that will drive an assessment again. Sandy? Yeah, I, I would just bring up the, the way you answered that um, one question earlier very nicely was um, with the turnover, um, that's it's really going to be dependent upon that with the the training and so forth. I know in healthcare, especially during COVID, there was a large amount of turnover uh, with nurses, and they really struggled getting nurses, and they and they still do, obviously. So I think it's a lot of you know how often do people need to be trained, and um, how do you do the training too? Can you do the train the trainer? You know, a lot of in healthcare, it's people learn from each other. Um, so I think that's really important. Um, so again, it kind of depends upon your particular system, the complexity, the factors, the people, um, and, and all of that. But remember, the the people are just one factor in this, and uh, you, you want to look at the entire uh, measurement system as well. Well, thank you so much, um, Doug and Sandy. And I think you know. Um, let me just first uh, go back and. Uh, I have to stop recording. Doug, can you uh, get that for me? Okay, I got it here. Yeah, Doug, can you please? I'm not sure how to stop recording the webinar first, okay. and I don't know. Perhaps, perhaps uh, Sandy has that control. Let me look. Hmm. Does not look like I do. Let's see. That recording is in progress. Uh, no, I can't. I can't stop it either. Okay, so, I don't know. Okay, All right, we... why don't I just review these slides and then we'll go from there. So these, yep. can you can you see the slides, Doug? Yes, yes. All right. So mm -hmm. if you have not um, joined ASQ, please consider joining it. It's a good resource for many um, thought leadership in the in inequality and in, uh, other areas related areas. Uh, if you go into the uh, my ASQ and scroll down to communities and find quality management division, again, there's a lot to look in there. Please, uh, we encourage you to do that. And for today's webinar, there's a LinkedIn link over here that you can continue your conversation on, and we encourage you all to do that. 
we are all out of time today. So thank you so much for joining in and have a good night. Bye-bye.